And thank you for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, PJ Healy, Dr. Paul Healy, here with us today. Uh, he is uh, a friend of the college, co author of mine from a few years back, and uh, just a, a great uh, great resource to have here on campus, and quite frankly, one of the smartest people I know here on campus. Um, let me read his bio. He's a professor of economics here at Ohio State University. He has a PhD in social science from Caltech in 2005. Uh, after completing his bachelor's degree at Purdue in 2000, then he joined uh, the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon for a few years before he came here to Ohio State. His research is uh, wide-ranging in focus with a lot of papers on mechanism design. I'm sure maybe you'll describe what mechanism design is for <laughs> people today. Uh, and implementation, behavioral game theory, uh, overconfidence, public goods, agent decision theory, individual decision-making under uncertainty, and experimental methodology. Uh, he's published in the American Economic Review, the JPE, Journal of Political Economy, the Psychological Review, Management Science, and several other fields and public interest journals. Uh, in 2009, he received the prestigious NSF Career Award for his work on behavioral mechanism design. And he's currently an associate editor of uh, American Economic Review Insights, who previously served as associate editor for American Economic Review. Um, let me also say just really quickly that it's uh, PJ's preference that um, we have uh, interactive dialogue. So feel free to not save your questions to the end. You can reach out, and just raise your hand, and interrupt him. Give it to PJ. Thank you very much, Noah. It was very flattering. Um, it's very nice to be here. Uh, this group of people, uh, it's my first time here, so thanks very much. Yeah, like Noah said, I prefer this to be kind of a dialogue, a casual, casual kind of interaction. So. Interrupt me anytime if anything's confusing or if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, yeah, so this is work uh, with John Peg, who's also in the econ department. Uh, it's our first time working together despite being colleagues for like 16 years. So um, basically, <clears throat> what I'm interested in is belief and dissipation, right? So um, suppose we got two people playing a game. This is a movie Footloose from the 80s. That's uh, <laughs> Ren and Chuck, I believe. Uh, they're driving tractors straight towards each other. The first one square loses. Um, and if we want to study like how people behave in strategic interactions, an important part of that is understanding the beliefs about each other. Okay, so what's the belief that your opponent's going to score first? Right? So maybe as researchers, we're not so interested in teenagers playing tractor shaking, but you know, if you want to study like uh, interaction between organizations, governments, firms. Beliefs matter, right? In any strategic situation, beliefs matter. Part of what I do is try to think about behavioral game theory models, like models that are good at predicting behavior in strategic settings. So if I want to understand those models, I'm gonna, or if I want to build those models and understand how people behave, I'm gonna need to know what people's beliefs are. Okay, so learning people's beliefs is an important part of basic research, and also an important part of certain applied work that we're trying to uh, understand why you know, certain agencies are doing what they're doing. So the question is, how do we learn people's beliefs? Okay. Now, the simplest way is um, just unincentivized. Get rid of this farm. The simplest way is just unincentivized. Uh, just ask people by survey. Um, now that's actually fine. In a lot of cases, that's all you can do. Uh, there's a worry, however, that there's hypothetical bias, meaning it's it's been documented that when you just ask people like to what risks are they willing to take? They'll overstate the risks they're willing to take. Okay, so they tend to skew their answers. Uh, you know, in, in, as some sort of social compatibility bias, they want to look a certain way or, or act as if they have certain references they, they, they don't really have. Right. Um, so the reason we use incentives, and as an economist, it's really important to, to me to use incentives, is uh, because of Vernon Smith's dominance principle. The Vernon Smith got the Nobel Prize for kind of laying the foundations for experimental economics. Uh, Vernon Smith's dominant principle is that the incentives we provide people should be large enough to sort of overwhelm any other intrinsic incentive they might have to misrepresent. Right? So if we pay them enough for their beliefs and we pay them in a way that gets them to tell the truth, then this hypothetical bias should sort of go away. So we're going to focus today on how to incentivize people to tell the truth about their beliefs. Now there's two dental families of mechanisms that exist in theory for getting people to tell the truth. The first is scoring rules. So the classic is the quadratic scoring rule. You might have heard of this, the Breyer scoring rule, in fact, 1950. But in theory, there's um, tons of other scoring rules that are possible. They all just vary in the functional form. Um, 
One issue with these scoring rules that I'll get into a little bit later is that they require risk neutrality that people not be risk averse at all. There are ways around this. Um, I'll get into that a little bit, but so that's kind of an issue that you have to deal with if you're going to use scoring rules. The other family of mechanisms um, relates to the BDM, Becker Group Marshak mechanism, which you may have seen for like value elucidation. Uh, we can use that here to uh, elicit beliefs instead of values. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can pre present a BDM mechanism. You can present it in a sort of standard way, you can present it as an ascending clock auction, uh, you can present it as sort of a multiple price list or multiple choice list. Uh, so I'm going to focus on this last one here for reasons I'll describe in just a minute. But yeah, but basically, one question is, you know, of all these different methods for listening to people's beliefs, is there one that's best, some sense, theoretically or empirically? And that is not a known, you know, we don't know the answer to that question, so part of this product is trying to answer that. Which of these should you use, have to use one? Right. And each is theoretically and sense compatible, and sense compatible mean people will tell the truth under different assumptions about people's preferences. Right? So I'm going to focus on these two in particular. Um, why? Because if you look at past empirical support experiments, or if you look at theoretical support, these two seem to be the, the best two out there. But there hasn't been a direct comparison of those two against each other. Okay? So part of this project is just comparing those against each other. All right, so let me show you an example of a kind of of how we can elicit people's beliefs and a task we might use in an experiment in the lab um, to elicit people's beliefs. And by the way, we have an experimental lab over in uh, Arps Hall in our building, uh, you know, undergraduates come in. And we have them participate in economic situations and we pay them for their behavior and we observe how they behave. So this would be something that we would do here in our lab. Um, and this is from some prior work. Doesn't work, but uh, so. This is a task here where I'm going to flip a coin. If it's heads, the red jar is chosen. If it's tail, the blue jar is chosen. I'm not going to tell you which jar it was. Instead, I'm going to pull out two marbles from the jar and show you which marbles were drawn. And I'll do it with replacement. Now, suppose that I say, okay, two, I, I pulled out two marbles and both of them were blue. Then you should update your belief. What's the probability that it was the red jar versus the blue jar? So if I ask you, what's the probability that it's the red jar, given that I drew two blue marbles out of it? Well, if you're a Bayesian, I think the correct answer is 20%. Forget, I think it's 20%. Um, that's something if I want to study, are people Bayesians? Do they do Bayesian updating? I would use this task and ask people the probability, but I'd want to pay them for their answer in such a way that they tell the truth. They, you know, they report truthfully what they believe the probability of the red jar really is. Okay. So let me show you the two mechanisms that I'm going to be focused on today. So um, people have some belief uh, of P, so the probability of the, of the red jar being chosen is P, which is not directly observable. I'm going to ask them to report it to me. So the binarized quadratic scoring rule, the way it works is they're going to report a number Q, which might be a lie. They can report whatever they want. I can't, I don't know the truth. So they can report whatever they want. And then I'm going to reveal to them whether it was the red jar or not. If it was the red jar, then they're going to get this paint, this quadratic loss payment. So one minus the probability squared. If it was the blue jar, then the then it was, you know, the true probability is zero. So zero minus Q squared is, a, is your loss. Okay. Um, and these payments, the original formulation was that these would be dollar payments, but it turns out it, it works better uh, in, in theory if instead of these being dollar payments, these are probability payments, meaning there's a fixed prize of $8. This is the probability you win the prize if you report Q, and it's actually the red jar. This is the probability you win the $8 prize if you report Q, and it's actually the blue jar. Okay? And so then if you write it out, well, what's my overall probability win the prize? Well, my belief, my personal belief as a subject is probably P is the red jar, and here's the probability I get paid if it's the red jar. Probably one minus P is the blue jar, and here's what I get paid, the probability I get paid if it's the blue jar. Do a little bit of uh, calculus, uh, you know, first order condition, solve this thing, and you find that telling the truth is the optimal report. Okay. Now, if you're like me, you should be a little bit skeptical. If you think that people really like look at this and immediately see that truth telling is optimal or not. So question one is, does this really work? So in theory, if you think about pen and paper, this works, people should tell the truth. 
but do they really? Do they understand? It? Okay. So that's the BQSR methods. Um, on the other side, we've got what I might call the multiple price list. So here, there's going to be a hundred rows, and each row asks you a question. Uh, you have a choice between option A and option B. On every row, option A is, would you rather have $8 if the red jar was chosen? Option B is, do you want $8 with some fixed probability? 57%, 58%, 9%, and it's increasing. Okay? And the idea is, on the early rows, you should want option A, because these probabilities are very low. But as you work down the list, at some point, you're going to switch over to the, to the lottery with the objective probability, because the probability is getting higher. In fact, your switch point, where you switch from here to here, should reveal your indifference point, which is your probability that the red jar was chosen, right? So if I think the red jar is 60% chance, then on this row, I'm exactly indifferent between taking this option and taking this option, right? And on any higher row, I'm gonna take option three. Okay. And uh, there's a hundred rows, I have it in a scroll box here, you can't see all hundred rows, but the subject can scroll up and down, see all the rows. Okay, and so we are just going to have them fill out this list. Uh, for simplicity, I'll have I'll just enforce a single switch point. So you just click here, and it fills out automatically everything to the left, everything over here on the right. And I'm going to interpret your switch point as your probability of red job. Okay. Any questions about these two mechanisms? I'm going to go into more detail a little bit later, but that's the idea. Yeah. Theoretically, is the MPL? Uh, you mentioned that the BQSR is um, assumes no risk aversion, risk neutrality. Is that is that same assumption? Right. So, thank you. Um, uh, they, the reason we pay probabilities instead of dollars is that gets rid of the risk risk aversion concern. So, by paying probability, we no longer need to assume risk neutrality. Uh, and this one here uh, doesn't need it doesn't need any assumption of risk neutrality either. So, both of these should now work even if people are risk averse. Yeah, thank you for asking that because I needed to. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what's been done so far in the literature? There's a bunch of papers that try to test these mechanisms. Um, several papers have documented that BQSR works better than other alternatives, which I won't get into. There's really only one paper that directly tests this multiple price list thing and shows that it does well against uh, standard BDN. But nobody's compared these two against each other. So this is kind of a winner, and this is kind of a winner, but uh, nobody's compared those. So, so, so step one, what I got interested in going into this is, which of those is bad? Okay. Right, so that was my first motivation. Um, and at that point, John Tegel was not involved in the project. But here's where it gets tough. How do I know whether a mechanism works or not? Because I don't know people's true belief. So how do I know if they told the truth? That's the hard part. Okay. So one way people attack that is they make the question really simple. So forget all the marbles. Let's just have two jars, coin flip, red, it's, uh, sorry, heads, it's red, tails, it's blue. Okay. And I just ask you, what's the probability of the red jar? Obviously, 50% is the correct answer. Um, so the advantage of this experiment is probably if one has a correct belief of 50%, and I can just ask, do they report 50%? Um, so that's the advantage of this experiment. It's almost certainly the, the true belief is 50%, so I know the true belief. The disadvantage of this experiment is I think it's a weird experiment because I'm telling you the answer is 50%, and then I ask you what's the answer. I don't think, you know, I worry that subjects might distrust that experiment, think that there's some twist or something that, that I'm not telling them. Right? So they might lie just because they're like, I don't, this is too easy, what's going on? Right? So I would like a task that, uh, where I can know people's true beliefs, but it's not so obvious that I just tell them the answer and ask them to report back to me. So that's why people use this marbles task. The advantage of that is it's less suspicious. It is a kind of hard problem, but then it's too hard, right? We don't, we don't know if they have a correct belief of 20%. Okay? So we're sort of stuck in this literature. How can we test whether a mechanism works if this is too suspicious and this is too hard? So what should what kind of task can I use to do this to test whether these mechanisms work? Yeah. So this is where John Cagle comes in. So he's got a bunch of papers that use what's called a team chat, right? So what we're going to do instead of having a subject work as an individual, I'm going to put subjects in teams of two, 
And I'm going to give them a problem like this problem here. And they are on computers. They don't talk in person. They chat through, through messaging on a computer. Um, and they're going to, as a team, have to decide on what their belief is and then what to report into the mechanism. Okay? And they're both going to get paid the same thing. And what I can do as a researcher then is scan their chat transcripts to see, A, what was their true belief? So now I can see, oh, their true belief was 20%. And more importantly, B, did they lie on purpose about their belief? Right? Because the worry about these mechanisms is that they might incentivize people to lie or something. Right? Or, or people, if people don't understand the incentive, they might consciously manipulate their reports. Okay? That's what we're worried about. So we're going to compare those two mechanisms using teams and looking at the chat transcripts to see if there's obvious evidence of them manipulating the reports. Okay. So if they don't report the correct belief, is it because they didn't have the right belief or is it because they actually wanted to manipulate? They wanted to lie on purpose about their belief. And the, uh, the assumption is that if they are lying on purpose, that they're going to chat it. So like, okay, yes, our, my true belief is 20%, but let's report 40% because I think that gives a better thing. We can see messages like that, then we have identified manipulations. Okay. Um, and an advantage of this is I can do this on a hard question, I can do this on an easy question, and I can do this on any question you want. I no longer need to know what the true answer is because I can just look at the track transcripts for what the true what they're true. So we can do we're gonna do it on all kinds of different questions. Um, we can even elicit means and medians of random variables and instead of just beliefs that are like about true false events. I won't talk about that today. Time. But let me give you a preview of the results. So first, on both mechanisms, misreporting instances of people saying, let's report something other than our true belief are very low, especially on the easy questions. And there's very little evidence of conscious manipulation. There's no, almost no team say, yeah, let's, let's lie about our belief okay, for both mechanisms. Now, there is evidence, however, of confusion and mistakes, especially in these harder questions. I mean, no surprise, people don't know what belief they quote, should have. Given. Now, they can have any belief they want, no rules, but they, like, they just don't know what belief to even have. So, a lot of times, what we see in the chat messages is confusion and mistakes about the beliefs themselves, not conscious manipulation. Right, so, maybe at this point, you're thinking, well, gee, well, why? Is there even concern that people misreport on purpose in these things? The answer is yes. And a paper just published, fortunately for us, a paper just published in the AER uh, studying the binarized quadratic score rule that I've just been talking about. And they did basically this problem. Oh, no. Sorry, the easy problem here. But they varied whether it was 50%, 60%, 70%, 80%. But they always gave them the, you know, the true probabilities of red versus blue. Okay? So um, these bars here are the percentage of subjects who did not report the correct probability. So when it, the correct probability was 20% uh, red jar, 60% of subjects did not report 20%. When it was 30% red jar, you know, almost 60% of subjects did not report uh, 30%. So there's a huge amount of people where you tell them the correct probability and ask them to report it back, and they don't report it back. They report something different. They tend to push towards 50 30. Okay. So, when the correct probability is 50 50, the amount of lying drops, but it's still non zero. Now, what was interesting in this paper is they had an original treatment where they gave the subjects all the information about the incentives. They showed them the formulas and gave them calculators and everything. When you take away all that information, the degree of misreporting drops dramatically. Okay. So, now people start telling the truth about you know, they report the correct probabilities. So, what this paper suggests is there's a massive amount of this report. Even on easy questions where you tell them the objective probability, they don't report back the number that you tell them. Okay. So this raises a lot of eyebrows. These incentive mechanisms don't work the way we thought they would. I'm going to show you that we don't replicate this result at all, and these mechanisms are fine. So um, I'm glad this paper exists it's, um, because it, it, this is evidence that maybe people are manipulating on purpose. I'm going to show you that people are not manipulating. Okay, so to fill in our design, we're going to, based on, because of that paper, we're going to add a treatment where we take away information. So we um, do the BQSR, but with no information about how the incentives work. We just tell people it's in your best interest to go through. All right. 
So uh, yeah, we still get misreporting as low on easy questions. That's different from this previous paper. Um, the confusion and mistakes on hard questions actually goes down when mechanism details are given. So this suggests that when you show people these formulas for like the BQSR payout formulas, it actually seems to trigger more sort of calculation in people's minds. They actually do a better job of, of identifying the correct probability. Okay, and the no info treatment also does well. But it's not needed because in our data, when you show people the incentives, they don't misreport either. Okay, so our results all look like this, even better than this. Uh, we don't have anything that looks like this. So we don't see misreporting at all in any of these mechanisms. Okay. What's crazy is that just recently we've run new treatments where we invented a scoring rule where you should misreport. So we created a scoring rule where the optimal report is to lie. Or you should report it 100% or 0%. Even when they should lie, they don't lie. So um, they don't even recognize the incentives uh, that are pushing, you know, that, that theoretically are pushing them to report one thing or another. Okay? So it seems that people are actually pretty insensitive to the, to the, incentive, to the incentives that we're giving. Yeah. Do you know if that result holds if people act alone rather than? Um, I, what I can say. Uh, I'll show you that. So we do, we compare individuals acting alone versus teams. Uh, the short answer is that the choices that we observe are basically the same between individuals and teams. So it looks like the team process doesn't change things much. There's a little bit of difference between these. Yeah. So you're saying it's teams, it's, it's really a dyad. Have you played around with larger teams? No, uh, that's a good question. So, John. So John Pagel has a bunch of papers where he does teams. I think he has some stuff on larger teams. Um, he's interested in more like team dynamics and uh, do teams outperform individuals. And there, yeah, larger teams do perform better. So on tasks where there's an objectively right answer, larger teams will perform better. Um, so he has some work on that. But in this project here, we just have giants. Okay, let me... Go through the theory kind of briefly. Um, if you, you know, Larry Savage is this really groundbreaking, super important book from 1954 about perspective utility theory, but he also has this really beautiful paper from 1971 about um, elicitation of probability, uh, which, even though this paper is now, what, 50 some years old, it's still, you know, this contains like all the knowledge we have today. This, this paper just laid everything out, and that's everything we know was in this paper in 1971. It's a really cool book. Right, so let me uh, go through a little bit the, the theory real quickly of, of this PQSR and why it works. So again, people will have a subjective belief P, they report Q, uh, they get this probability payment if the event, let's say we want to know their probability of some event E. They get this payment if E occurs, they get this payment if not E occurs. Um, this is the binarized quadratic scoring rule, so PQSR. Um, I'm often going to screw up and call it BSR. Those mean the same thing if you see that. Okay. So again, that's how it works. Why is it not compatible? Well, I already kind of mentioned this, but if you if you write it all out, there's the overall probability of getting paid when you report uh, Q. And if you just take you know, take derivatives that equal to zero, the maximizer of that is P. So telling the truth maximizes the spot. Um, under what assumptions would people do that? So it requires that they use this formula. So it, re it requires that when thinking about this mechanism, that they think about the overall probability in this way, that they multiply their subjective belief P times the subjective probability that's in blue. And this subjective belief 1 minus P times this objective probability that's in blue. Okay, so they're doing this multiplication calculus. People don't necessarily do that multiplication calculus. So, so this is a form of sort of reduction of compound lotteries. You can think of this as a compound lottery, and people, the assumption here is that people are reducing this compound lottery into a single number and then maximizing that number. Okay. Um, there's some theoretical background for this, blah, 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 blah. But, but basically, the assumption is that people think in this way. They multiply these probabilities together in their head or act as if they multiply these probabilities together in their head. Okay. I think that's a strong assumption. I'm probably pretty easy to right. um, I mentioned that we're paying in probabilities here uh, to get rid of risk aversion concerns. Does that work? In general, there's evidence that no, that doesn't get rid of risk aversion concerns. 
but in sporting literature, people still seem to use that and still seem to think it works like. So we're we're going to use that method of painting. Okay. There's a second problem, potential problem, with this binarized quadratic scoring rule, which that previous paper highlights. So there's sort of an asymmetry to the payoffs in this mechanism, which, which isn't obvious until you get people calculated. So this table shows you, if you report a belief of 5% and E does not happen, then you're gonna get paid with almost 100% chance. If E does happen, you get paid with 9.75%. Okay, so when you report this, you get this probability, if not E, this probability of payments, if E. Now look what happens as you increase your report. This number barely changes. This number shoots way up. So when you give people a calculator and let them monkey around with like different inputs, they will see that this number isn't changing much and this number is changing a lot. So what you might see, the conjecture is people will be like, oh, you know what? As I push my report towards 50-50, I gain a lot here, but don't lose much here. So I wanna, I wanna manipulate. I wanna push toward 50-50. Even if my true belief is 5%, I wanna report with 25% because it doesn't cost me much here and it gains me a lot here. The flaw in that logic is that this event is, if you have a low belief, this event is very likely and this event is very rare. So you shouldn't put much weight on this increasing rate like because it's a rare event. But anyway, that's that's the conjecture. That when people play around with the calculator, they realize that this grows a lot, this doesn't change much, and so there's pressure to push towards 50-50 support. Um, right. Okay, so that's the concern. And this previous paper argues that that's what's going on, and that's what's causing people not to tell the truth within this mechanism. I want to show that that's not this. All right, what about the MPL? What's the theory behind that? So here again is a list. Um, suppose that your belief is Q. Uh, and so you pick option A on all rows up to Q and option B on all rows after Q. That means that you're indifferent, basically between this and this, like I said before. Uh, X equals one means the event is true, sorry. Um, so under what conditions is this incentive compatible? Like when, why do people tell the truth here? Well, it has this dominance property. Suppose that you lie. Suppose your true belief is Q, but you switch at row Q plus three, or Q plus three. What you've done is you haven't changed anything on all these rows, and you haven't changed anything on all these rows, but on these two rows, you've given yourself something worse. You think this event has probability Q, so you should prefer this and this, not this and this. So by lying, anytime you misreport, you create roads where you get something worse for yourself. So that's sort of a dominated decision in that sense. Row by row, you've made yourself worse weekly. Okay. So you can explain this to such You can say, on this list, if you misreport, you're going to create rows where you get something worse for yourself. Okay. This does not require any kind of multiplying of probabilities together. It's much more straightforward in my mind. They just need to understand that if you lie, you hurt yourself on some rows, and you don't change anything on any other rows. So. Um, we have a theorem. Basically, if, if you believe that binary quadratic square rules is incompatible, then people must be doing this reduction, you know, multiplying the probabilities together. Well, if they're doing that, then they're going to satisfy this row dominance. And in that case, then the L is also incompatible, and people will tell the truth. So this theorem basically shows that if you're willing to use the BQSR, you should also be willing to use the MPL. The MPL should be theoretically superior to the EQSR. Okay. All right, so that's the background on theory. Just pause there. Any questions, more questions about the mechanisms themselves or the background? Cool. Okay. Um, so halfway done already. You know, so let me uh, try to get to the experimental design quickly and explain the results. Um, I probably have more slides than we can get to today, but that's okay. So the way that the experiment works, uh, we actually ran this in our lab. Well, actually, some of it was run during the pandemic with Zoom meetings, which is terrible. Uh, but you, as a subject, you come into the lab, you come into the Zoom meeting, and we're going to ask you five different questions about probabilities, like what's the probability of a red jar, stuff like that. We're also going to ask you some questions about the means and medians of like a random variable. Like I said, I'm not going to talk about that today, but you first do these 11 questions as individuals. Then we pair you up into teams of two, and you repeat those same 11 questions. 
Right. And so now I can observe differences between individuals and teams, and then in the teams, I can observe the chat messages to see if you're manipulating questions. Are there any screenings for these students? Like, do they have to have a base understanding of probabilities to participate? No. Um, it's a good question. So sometimes when we run these experiments, we will do kind of uh, understanding questions or screening questions. In this one, we did not. So this is um, these are all almost all OSU undergrads. So you know, they at least have a, enough of a background to get into OSU, but um, you know, there's no, no further screening beyond that. Yeah. When we run online experiments, we tend to do a lot more screening and conference and checks, but uh, here, less so. Uh, there's, so you have these blocks of questions, the order of the blocks is randomized, uh, the order of the questions is randomized within the block, and so on and so forth. As a subject, you'll only encounter one mechanism. So if you have the MPL, you'll encounter the MPL all the way through. If you have the VQSR, that will be all the way through. Okay, so a subject doesn't see different numbers. They only see one. I think that's, yeah. We did run a session where we did teams first, individual second, and then it was really nice. So order doesn't matter. Okay, let me show you the actual questions, at least the probability questions that we gave them. This turned out to be the easiest in terms of percentage of people who get it right. This jar contains red and blue marbles. The computer will randomly draw one marble from the jar. Uh, here, just to make sure they, un they understand everything, we ask them, how many red marbles are there? Uh, the answer is 12. How many total marbles are there? The answer is 20. What do you think is the probability that a red marble will be drawn? Well, 12 divided by 20 is 60%. So the correct answer here is 60%. Now, I don't care if they get the correct answer or not. What I care about is when they chat with each other, do they talk about lying? Do they say something like, oh, and I know it's 60%, but let's say 70%, or let's say 40%. So I'm curious if they're lying. Not so, not so much interested in whether they get 60% right. The question, the question is, do they lie on purpose? I also do this one, I'm sorry to show you, just 50-50, red jar, blue jar. This is what the probability of red jar is chosen. I also do this one. Uh, here we draw a single blue marble. I ask you what's the probability of the red jar. Here we draw two blue marbles. What's the probability of the red jar? And then we do this one. Uh, in 2005, we asked a Carnegie Mellon undergraduate student this question What's the capital of Australia? What do you think is the probability that they got this question right? Now, here, arguably, there's not even a correct answer. Right? This is just a subjective belief. What do you think is the belief? What is, what is your belief about the probability? That some student from Carnegie Mellon in 2005 that we've never met uh, got this one question. Right. The nice thing about this methodology is that I don't care whether they get this quote right or not. Again, all I'm interested in is do they lie? So they, they might say, oh, I think it's 20%, but let's say 40%. That's my question. <clears throat> we also ask like medians and means. I'm going to skip through that. They're like, what are spinners? Like, what's the median of this spinner? What's the mean of the spinner? And so on. I'll skip that for today. The results aren't much different. Uh, here's what the interface looks like for the MPL. Uh, so literally, you, I just showed it to you earlier. You click here and it, you know, it picks option A. Prior to that, option B, below that. It always has this language. Remember, you maximize your overall probability of getting $8 when you report truthfully. That's important. This, this sentence appears in all the treatments. And uh, you, you, know, you click your choice and lock it in. Okay? Um, with the BQSR, if you type in a probability like 60%, it will tell you what the two possible payment probabilities are. This is the like one minus Q squared, this is the zero minus Q squared thing. So it actually gives you the output of those, those calculations. And it even gives you this table saying if the true probability were 60%, then your overall probability of getting paid would be blah if you report blah. So it even shows in this table. Yeah, I know it's small, but it shows them that reporting truthfully gives you the highest overall probability of getting paid. And if you deviate, that number goes down. It goes down very slowly, but it does go down. So it shows them directly that truth telling maximizes your probability of getting paid. Okay. And we have this sentence remember, you maximize your overall probability of getting $8 when you report truth. <clears throat> All right, uh, the no info treatment. We just don't have any info. We just say we're going to maximize overall probability of getting eight dollars and you report truthfully. We don't tell them how they're paid. We just say there's some magical formula, and if you report truthfully, it gives you the highest, highest probability. Okay. 
Uh, how does chat work? Well, they just have a chat window. They can send messages to each other. There's a timer running. If the timer gets down to zero, then uh, if they if they haven't made an agreement, so the way it works is they have they both have to type in a belief. If they agree, then they can move on. If they don't agree, then they're stuck until until they either agree or time runs out. If time runs out, then we randomly pick one of the I have a silly question. Okay. So I'm trying to think of like the behavior. Why would somebody want to lie? This is a basic question, but why would they want to lie about something like this? Like yeah. I, I get why you lie about many other things, but why would you lie if you know the probability that people I mean why why would you right. like, versus I'm just gonna be sloppy and try to answer this question quickly, like right. different biases that might creep in, but why would I like lie about something? Right, like this? exactly. So um this argument here from that other paper, the paper that was published in Pittsburgh people, they give an argument here that, oh, when you when you see these payoff probabilities and they're like, they're really increasing here and not changing much here. Right. If people right. realize that, then they might want to misreport. So you're giving the payoff probabilities too in the experiment that you're doing in your lab? Yeah, exactly. So uh, so in your lab here, you're also giving them the payoff probabilities. Yeah, so exactly. These numbers right here are those numbers I just showed you. Okay. And, and if you change that 60 to 50 or change it to 55, you'll see these change. So you're trying to see if they're going to lie if they if they think they might get paid more. If, yeah. If they, even though they know the probability of this because they know the true answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I kind of in my head I laugh a little bit at economists because maybe economists are the only people that think that someone's going to lie here. But like economists are very seriously worried that people are going to lie here. Without the incentive issue, mm -hmm. would you think people might just lie on this? I mean, so the you know, incentives were supposed to be eliciting truth. Uh. No? So you're saying like if we didn't pay at all? Right. Just, yeah. So there's the hypothetical bias. I think they're. Probably the hypothetical bias wouldn't show up on these questions because they're pretty sterile. Right, right, like right. They're kind of like math questions. Right. So I think the hypothetical payment would work fine on these. Okay. In other more sensitive domains, we do worry a lot about yeah. So if you yeah. wanted to port this to a more sensitive question, right. then I would want to use incentives. Okay. But I think here, hypothetically, would probably be fine. There was another question. Uh, I was just raising my hand. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, so chat methodology, blah, 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 they can chat with each other. Um, okay, so standard OSC subject pool, a lot of it was done on Zoom. Um, there's some missing observations because people would like leave the Zoom meeting and go to the experiment, sort of stuff like that, and paid by the Venmo. You basically get $12 if you complete the experiment, and then you have this chance of winning $8 that I've been describing. So some people won $8 based on their answers. Okay, uh, here's the number of subjects. Um, you know, power, not, not super high power. All right, let's get to the results. So uh, this, like I said, was the easiest question. The correct answer is 60%. Um, this is, for each mechanism, the percentage of people or teams that said 60%. Okay? And it's pretty high. Um, we do see, let's look at, let's focus on teams. Okay? The BSR, BQSR, every single team that we had reported 60%. No manipulation, no one got it wrong. When we had the MPL, the, the price list, the like choice list thing, we did have some teams not report 60%. So the question is, were they lying because they wanted to consciously manipulate the payments, or did they just get it wrong somehow? So that's where the chat messages come in. I can disentangle whether they were lying on purpose or whether they just made a math mistake. And the answer is, they made math mistakes. So here's an example. This is actual chat dialogue. Uh, one team members on the left, one team members on the right. I have 12 for red, 8 for blue, 12, 20, 75%. Yes, that's wrong. It should be 12, 20, 60%, not 75. This person just acquiesces. 75 is good. Okay. <laughs> so the teammate agrees, even though maybe they realize it's wrong, they report 75%. So yeah, that was not 60%. This is not manipulating the payoffs. They're not talking about the payoffs at all. These people just made a math mistake and went along with it. Um, someone here said, sorry, I put a wrong answer for three. I think what they mean is the third question was the probability question. Someone put in a wrong answer of 50, but their teammate like agreed with it and locked it in. So I just moved forward with the wrong answer. Again, not a conscious manipulation of the incentives, just a mistake. Okay. Uh, these are the only two teams that got it wrong. So here's our two data points. There's no evidence of manipulation. They just, they just got it. And it seemed unrelated to the mechanism. The fact that this was an MPL versus BQSR seems completely orthogonal to be dismissed. Right. Uh, here's the second easiest question. Just 50 50. 
So now we have seen the MDL does pretty well. The BSR does a little bit worse. So it's kind of the other way around. Is that, so now with this 50 50 question, do we see people misreporting on purpose or are they somehow getting points of wrong? Turns out they're getting points of wrong. So uh, someone says 50 percent, then their partner says, so theoretically it's 50, right? But I think I said 48 last time just because it's in the stats right now. And we just did probability stuff about how smaller sample sizes are further from the probability. So flipping at once might be 60 40, but 100 times it's flipping 50 50. But yeah, I'm good with just 50. The partner's nice and says, okay, let's do 49 percent based on your flawed logic. So <laughs> they do 49 percent. So I report that as an error in my data. Clearly, just someone didn't do a good job of stats class. Um, this one is a little bit more silly. So 50, I said 60. Why? Because head is always more likely. That's the fault. 55 is compromise. It's also wrong. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's not manipulating the incentives. They're just someone's incentive. Um, there's, there's more than six, they didn't even chat at all. So someone just put in 75, and the other person just agreed with 75. I don't know why. So, anyway, uh, this presentation is a bit funny because it's like stand up comedy for a bit. But, uh, but the point is, the serious point is, they're not manipulating and it has nothing to do with the mechanism. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. So, you didn't have a requirement that they chat. That's right. Um, in fact, oftentimes they'll chat a lot in the first couple of questions and they'll chat a lot less as the experiment goes on. They'll just like, 70? Yes. So, Early on, they, they chit chat a lot, and later on, just like they're all business, it's very little chat. Okay, and so this one was no chat, and you're putting it out because it's the wrong answer. But yeah. did you find a lot of instances of no chat? Uh, a lot of instances of no chat, but um, rarely was it the wrong answer. So there's a lot of instances of no chat, but they get it right. So what happens? I regret this a little bit. If I type in, suppose you and I are a team, if I type in 75%, you can see that I typed in 75%. So I don't need to send a message because you can just see that I've typed it. If I could do this whole thing again, I would make it hidden so you don't, I'd have to tell you where I did. That's, I regret that a little bit. Yeah, so they didn't, they didn't have kind of bargaining without chatting. Uh, median question, um, let's skip that. Okay. So what I've tried to do here is Rank the problems by how difficult they were when they did the task as an individual, meaning how frequently or how far off were they from the right answer when they did the task as an individual, and then how far off from the right answer were they when they did the task as a team. Um, so each like vertical set of data is a different task. This is the uh, 12, 20, 60, this is the point flip, this is the so on. Um, most of the data are below the 45 degree line. What that means is that that error is lower in teams than it is in individuals. So teams do better than individuals at getting the right answers on these questions. The more interesting thing for me is if blue dots are MPL and orange dots are the binary product scoring rule, which one has lower error? So if we look which lower blue or orange, here it's orange, and here you can't see where it's blue, orange, blue. Orange, uh, it's hidden here behind the one here. It's orange. There's no obvious pattern that one's better than the other. So if you ask me, MPL versus BSR, they're both working pretty well, and there's not the fact that one's better than the other. Even though we have this theorem, the MPL should be better in the data they both perform fine. The other pattern that jumped out, which we didn't expect, is when you don't provide information. Then on the hard questions, they do worse. Their error rate actually jumps up. So on hard questions like that Bayesian updating and two marble stuff, if I don't provide any information about how you're paid, they actually get it wrong more frequently than if I give them information about how they're being paid, which is kind of surprising because the information about how you're paid doesn't directly help you get the right answer. We think what's going on is this triggers more sort of math thinking or the different cognitive processors, but that's just too much. But it is evident that if you face a hard problem, the incentives might actually help, might actually help performance. Okay, so now we're going to be a little bit more scientific about the chat transcripts. Uh, we hired coders, um, people to analyze the chat transcripts uh, to, um, to identify instances of two things. 
One, what we call calculate. This is an instance where people talk about playing with the calculator. Oh, I tried different numbers and I saw that my payoff would change. Okay? So we're going to flag transcripts where we see people playing the calculator. And they don't have to actually end up deviating. As long as they just talk about it, playing the calculator, I'm going to flag it as calculator. I'm also going to flag instances where they talk of what, I'm sorry, where they say they're going to deviate from their true beliefs. And it doesn't have to come from the calculator. It's just if they say, I'm going to deviate from my true belief in any way, in any form, we're going to flag that as well. So these independent coders who are not involved in this project uh, flag all the track cat transcripts for these things. If we were more sophisticated, we you know maybe use some AI methods and some of the you know, language analysis kind of things, but uh, we're all tools, so we just use a chat for them. All right, and here's uh, the results. So um, how often do we see people talk about calculating? Playing with the calculator in the MPL only once. The BQSR they do play with it a lot. Well, not a lot, but a fair amount of teams, fair a good number of teams will talk about playing around with changing their answer and seeing how their payment changes. So the BSR, this product scoring rule thing, does sort of trigger people to play with it. Now, do they actually end up deviating? No, not much. So they end up playing with the calculator. Oh, this is interesting. As, I, as we change our reports, the payments change. But in the end, they um, I guess they believe the sentence that says it's in your best interest, and so they still they don't talk about deviating. They don't. Right. So in looking at that interface, though, the MPL you're seeing, you can scroll the whole thing. Yes. But the BSR to like see other information, you actually have to play with it, right? So, I mean, I yeah. kind of want to see what was going on, but if I can look at a whole list, I don't need to play around with it. Yeah. Things. So that's that's right. So the. BSR as, as you change your rate, you can play with it to see these numbers change. Yeah. I would try to provide this thing here to show how your payment probability would change if you if you did change your report. So this tries to get at exactly your point, like what would happen if I change my report. But it's true to see if these numbers, which are hopefully the numbers that matter, you do have to monkey around with your report. Whereas in the MPL, exactly as you said, you can just see everything all the So yeah, I think that's just sort of a fundamental difference in the <laughs> right, so yeah, uh, again, BSR, people like to play with it, but in the end, they don't do it. Right. How do you think theoretically about deviation when it's uh, a partner that says, sure, we'll give the wrong answer because your debts? Um, is it that yeah. deviation? Or... Um, if so, if they talk about deviating from their true belief then that would be flagged as deviation. But like this this person who thought that uh, hedge is 60%, I'm not going to call that a deviate because that is actually the true belief. They really believe 60%. Now, the question is, you got two people with different beliefs. One person thinks 60, one person thinks 50. Um, this is a bit of a gray area. I, our chat coders did not flag that as deviate. That's just agreed. So um, I believe in our data, yeah, that would... That would not show because those chats that I showed you those were not flagged as deep. So yeah, that's just acquiescing instead of eating. So that was your AI comment from before. You can manipulate that. I can manipulate what you could play around with that. Uh, I would not be a, a real team, but it have been to so manipulate the responses <laughs> if you thought that was going to be. Right. Um, I think I'm, I'm when people acquiesce to their partner, I don't view that as the thing we're worried about. The thing we're worried about is people their incentives and then wanting to change their answer because of the incentives that are given to them. If I'm just acquiescing to my partner, that has not much to do with the incentives themselves. That's just more it's sort of like, yeah, exactly. It's sort of the thing that social pressure, like you said. Um, so I'm, I'm viewing it as a separate thing. I think it is an, an interesting dynamic that could be studied, but strictly we're trying, on this project, trying to just focus on conscious manipulation because of the incentives. And I think this is just not that. But it's interesting. So the whole team dynamics are super interesting. There's a lot of stuff we can dig into there. And um, yeah, I think a lot of people would be very interested in that data. I'm trying to be very focused. And the papers were figured out as it is. So yeah, so unfortunately, we're very focused on it. One, just for a question. All right, um, 
but I can unpack these results. So that was across all questions. Let me break it down into the questions where there's objectively correct questions, objectively correct belief, and it's easy according to me. Um, objectively correct belief, and it's hard, or a subjective question, which is like the capital of Australia. Okay? And what we see is the MPL again, there's very little of anything going on, no calculating, no manipulating, no deviating. The BSR, where those deviations happen, is on the subjective question. So, like, what's the capital of Australia? What's the probability someone knows the capital of Australia? That's where people start monkeying around with it. So, this is further evidence that when you show people these payoff mechanisms, it just triggers them to think more so. They start like playing with the calculator. And even though the calculator doesn't help them solve the problem of what's the probability the person got it right, they're just searching for something. I don't know. They're, they're, they're playing around with the calculator trying to figure out the. So on hard questions and subjective questions, that's where we see people, you know, munching around with these calculators trying to try out different things. I guess that assumes that people have a belief about the percentage of people who know the capital of Australia, right? Yeah, yeah. I might not know or care. So I kind of go into it agnostically, or, you know, and I'm like playing around being like, well, yeah, maybe getting some information that way. Yeah, um, this is great. Back in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, like people like Frank Ramsey and Bruno Di Panetti were trying to trying to figure out what a subjective probability would mean. And this is the core question of that. And they took kind of an economics -y angle to it, which is you don't have to have a belief, but once I ask you a question, once I force you to make a bet, that sort of forces you to have it. So by, by forcing you to answer this question, by forcing you to sort of put your money where your mouth is, I'm forcing you to have some sort of belief. It may not be a very well formed or coherent belief, but at least it's a belief of some sort. Is it a belief or a belief I'll get paid out maximally by figuring out, like, I should answer this way because I have no belief. So let me figure out what's the one at least is going to give me some money. Right. So the thing that gives you the most money, what gives you the most money depends on what your belief would be. So unfortunately, there's there's like, wow. there's not a right answer until you have a belief. So, um, yeah. I, yeah, this gets into philosophical stuff about what is it will be. So I'm, I'm going I'm to take, uh, take sort of the econ angle, which is that um, once I observe your betting behavior, that defines what is your current. So yeah, like, and part of the reason we want to use this is just because we're forcing you to form some sort of belief, or at least make a decision as a human being. And we're going to study that. Um, oh, yeah, so let's look at the capital of Australia. Um, I said 90, so 90% 90 chance they got it right because Carnegie is a prestigious school. And so they, um, they have to know this easy answer. What do you think? Should we go higher than 90? I think we should go higher 95, 100. Seems 100 gets a higher probability. So this, this is a BSR, and they're noticing that when you type in 100, that changes the payoff probabilities. Um, um, and this is the overall payoff probability when you type in 100. So like, okay, let's, uh, should we do 100? And then they did 100. So this is an example of calculate. So this is flagged as calculate and flagged as deviate because they were saying a belief of 90 and reported a hundred. So this is like one example of both calculate and deviate. That's the team that deviated. And it seems that they deviated because of the incentives and the methods. But again, this is extremely rare. This is the only data point that looks like this. Sorry, I'm coming back to this question about like each of the two differences, right? How do you remind me how do you know who this person that says that we know the first person says their belief is 90, right? Right. How do we know what the true belief of the other person is? How do we know it wasn't 100? Right, exactly. So this is where we lean on the chat coders. Um, this is the chat coders coded this as uh, as as a D. Um, you're right. So it could be this the blue person did not report their belief. So it could be that they believed 100. Um, and this is just acquiescing to that. So it's, it's possible that this is misquoted. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, um, another thing, if I could somehow do this project again, it would be interesting to force them to make individual choices and then at the same time, then work as a team so I can see what their individual belief was, or at least what their individual report was. May not be true. Um, this is a deviate. The mean, this is a mean question to spin on. The mean is 50, but I think you should do 60. 
Um, this one's a gray area to me, but our chat coder said this is deviant. Okay. Again, there's not much of this, but that's one that was recorded as a deviant. Um, here's one that wasn't flagged, so to give you a, maybe a false negative. So here are 12 marbles, 20, so 60%, got it, got it right. I think, but I'm thinking, should we really put the correct number for probability? I mean, yeah, I think, although it's random, it's the best option. All right, so they didn't deviate. This person kind of talked about deviating, but they didn't actually deviate. So our coders did not flag this, but this could be one more data point that might be a pivot to deviate. Um, this one here is a calculate. I noticed that the higher you make the percentage, the higher our probability percentage gets. Yeah, that's true. The closer to 50, the more equal the probability. So that's definitely, this is the thing that previous paper was noticing, like as you put towards 50, 50, your payoff probability is equalized. Um, and I said, I say go for a big one. So this was flagged as high plate Yeah, this one's calculate for you users to best stuff. So anyway, um, and uh, by the way, people, the question of what the capital of Australia is a good question because a lot of people think it's Sydney, so it's not. So a lot of people, in fact, they think they think it's Sydney, so they think everyone knows it's Sydney, so it's a really easy question. It's a good kind of trick question. If you ever need a good trick question. All right, so what's the story? Uh, yeah, we're almost out of time here. Um, I didn't, so the no info performs just as well as the. Um, the other two incentivized mechanisms um, on easy questions, although it did form kind of poorly on the harder questions. So uh, it does seem like showing incentives is a good thing. Um, the chat's concluded they're not successfully manipulating. Maybe there's more attempts in DSR, but in the end, they're not actually manipulating. Um, so the mechanism details can be distracting in some cases, but it can be useful in other cases. Now, um, since we have a couple of minutes, let me address, I'm calling that previous paper the Pittsburgh paper because the authors are all from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so why, given my results, I've seen very little manipulation, very little deviation. Everyone's just telling the truth in my data. Why did they get 60%? So this begs the question, and I'm friends with these authors, so kind of tense situation, like why are we getting massively different results? So I looked at their interface and they have urns like this, and the true probability is written right here. Uh, there's marbles in the urns, but they're not relevant. Um, and this true probability changes from screen to screen. One screen will be three and 10 is the correct answer, the next screen will be five and 10, the next screen will be eight and 10. So this is jumping around. And then you're supposed to click on the slider to report your belief. There were a couple of things I didn't like about this interface. One, having marbles is confusing because the marbles aren't relevant to the decision. Two, this is kind of small and changes from screen to screen. If some don't notice it, maybe they're not identifying the correct belief. And three, I don't trust slider input. I don't have great evidence for this, but I worry that sliders uh, have sort of a pull to center effect. But, so anyway, I, I redid their entire design with a much simpler, straightforward interface. <clears throat> here's a red jar, here's a blue jar. Here's the cases where the red jar is gonna uh, be drawn. Here's the cases where the blue jar is gonna be drawn. What's the probability that a red jar is chosen? 80% is very clearly the right answer. So I tried to make it just as straightforward and clear as possible what the right answer is. Um, and we did this with uh, BQSR, we did this with NPL, we did that with no info as well. And for my sake, I added what's called instruction only treatment. So we give them <laughs> we give them the mechanism details in the instructions at the beginning of the experiment, but they're not on every single page. Like if I were doing a real experiment, I wouldn't show them all these price lists and calculations on every single screen. I would just teach them in the beginning and then just ask them the probabilities as they go through that. So we added no the uh, instructions only treatment as well. And let me get to the results. Remember the Pixar paper was getting misreporting rates like this. I'm getting misreporting rates like this. Okay. NPL, BSR, the original ones. If we do instructions only, they perform even a little bit better. And then if we don't provide any information at all, that's the fact, although there's not much significant difference. There's no significant difference. Yeah. So the take home pain point is the interface mattered a lot. The Pittsburgh paper used an interface that led to a lot of misreporting. If you simplify the interface, this reporting goes way down. Our team chat showed that it's not conscious manipulation of the incentives, it's just mistakes that people make. Um, Complicating your screen with a bunch of details about the incentives might cause a little bit of problems. So just teaching them the incentives and in opening instructions might be good practice. 
showing nothing at all works fine. So if you're going to submit that to an economics journal for publication, your referees won't like it. So uh, I would recommend if you're an economist anyway, doing this. One of these is fine. I like this one because it's theoretically the best. Uh, but you know, if your if your referees and your editor are, don't mind whether the subjects know the incentives or not, this does perform very well. So you don't need to show them all the incentives. Crazy thing that we just added um, a nonsense parallel mechanism. I'm out of time, but we we did another mechanism where actually you should mind. Your best interest is to report 100 percent or zero percent. They still report the truth. They don't lie. So not only do the incentives not matter a lot, they're not even looking. Right? So even when they should lie, they're not lying. So I'll skip that with the given that one. There's a lot more fun stuff we can talk about, but that's it. I think I've I think I've said everything you need to know. And I think if you want to take home 20, it was this grab here. Okay. All right, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Great, and PJ is willing to stick around for doctoral students if you want to chat with him for a few minutes afterwards. Um, that's also yeah, yeah. great. Excellent. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you.